connected back to Joshua chapter 15. And one more announcement. We, I'm developing a culture, and I'll tell you where it came. It came with a slap in my face when Segi made a statement at the last ALS in Cape Town that you measure the culture of maturity in houses not by their tithes and not by their first fruits, but by their selfless offerings. And that offerings is one of the ways, free will offerings, is one of the ways that we measure the spiritual growth of people. And it's not a fundraising ploy. It's, it's something about those who grow in God grow also into selfless giving. And I want to develop that culture, not just in the seminar, but in everything we do without emphasizing money, but we can't come empty-handed to God. And I know that some of you have already given your offerings in the weekend, but keep doing that so that we, you access, you don't buy grace, grace is free but you release certain things in your spirit to access grace that is free. That's what happens. Giving is an amazing ability to, to selflessness. And the Hebronic community, if you really study the Hebronic community, uh, there's a big uh, culture that centers around hospitality, eating, and so forth, and giving. David was one of the biggest givers. He gave, by today's standards, billions to build the temple. Billions, and then the rest of Israel came and gave their offerings. And in this season, leaders must learn how to give selflessly. I believe in that principle. So, so we have the offerings here. We have machines. Use them to honor God. All right, let's get back to the word. Joshua 15. I want to read verse 16. We read from 13 to, to 15. But verse 16, And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kiriath Sefer and take it, to him will I give. Aksa, um, my daughter to wife. The name Aksa means one whose anklet is adorned with jewels or giftings. And the ankle speaks about mobility. So I will give anyone who overcomes, um, well, Kiryat Safer, which is after you've overcome um, Hebron, you can then get mobility. And remember what she asked for. She asked for the, the upper fountains and the lower fountains. She asked for heavenly and earthly blessings later on. Uh, and Otniel, the son of Kenaz, the, son of Cal the brother of Caleb, took it and, and, and he gave him Aksa, his, wife to, his daughter to wife. And it came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask her father a field. And, and, and she lighted off a, a donkey, an ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? Who, who answered, Give me a blessing. For thou hast given me a south land, give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Uh, this is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. And the utmost cities of the tribe of the children of Judah, towards the, the, the coast of Edom, southward were Kabzeel and Edda and Jagger and so forth. The, this whole, I, I don't have the time to go into it, but if you see the steps here, Hebron, Kiryat Sefer, then you come to Aksa, and then you come to getting an inheritance, and it's not a piece of land. But what she asked for, she asked for the field, and a girl, a lady asking for a field, was not part of an inheritance policy in those days. But she forced herself into this culture. And what God gave her was not a field, but in Caleb, she got the heavenly blessings and the earthly blessings, the upper springs the fountains from the heavens and the fountains from the earth, and, and, and it was an inheritance that is transferred to anyone who is in the spirit of Judah. And we are of the tribe of Judah, Judah because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and we are part of the tribe in the spirit. Now I want to show you how we take Hebron. And now we come to what I would call the practical side of all the things I've told you so far. I told you that Hebron was founded by Arba, the father of Anak. Anak, the name Anak means a long-necked giant. It also means a neck chain. Now, I don't have to give you graphic pictures, especially you Indian people here. You sons of God that are in an Indian skin. Because some of you come from Phoenix and Chatsworth and from Peter Maritzburg, and there the guys know how to wear big chains, gold chains. I mean, so heavy you must have a stiff, hard neck to carry the chain. You must do muscle building around the neck to get the chain. So it speaks of a neck chain. 
Um, and you, if you understand the neck chain, like the, the, the father of the prodigal put a chain around the neck of his son, um, when Pharaoh uh, gave Joseph a seat, made him the 2IC, the second in charge, his right-hand man. He put a chain around his neck. It's a symbol of status, of dignity. It's a symbol of honor, of respect. It's a symbol of influence, of leadership, etc. So when we talk about a long neck, we talk about a posture of, it's a resolute posture that could translate into a posture of pride. Pride. And uh, pride comes with ha holding certain very, very key positions. Uh, you know, it can have a negative connotation to it and a positive. But th there is something that comes with this. So when we talk about Anak, we're talking about somebody who is long-necked. And you know that when God deals with stubbornness, he often speaks about breaking the neck. He speaks about the, the obstinate person, how he would break his neck. In other words, he would disconnect his position of headship. The neck holds the head up. And the neck, if somebody commits suicide, he's disconnecting the neck. Uh, the, the neck is dis disconnected from the head and the body. Well, the body, the body and the head. So you cut yourself off from the body. Um, and so when we talk about a long-necked person, we're talking about somebody who is resolute, confident, um, who has a position of status, of stature, who is in a leadership position, uh, and that neck chain speaks about all the symbols of influence, of power, and so forth. So this place was occupied. The father of this place is called Anak. I mean, it's called Arba. And, uh, and Arba had um, a father, the son, called Anak. Okay? Now, the name Harba. Let's go to the name Arba. Arba means, listen to this, Arba means four square. So, so when we say Kiryat Arba, we're speaking about four square. What do we mean by four square? We mean that all sides of the square are equal. There's no, no side unequal. It actually speaks about perfect stature, perfect stature. It also speaks about strength. In biblical language, it speaks about strength of crouching, and it speaks about the number four. The number four in scripture, in, the, in gematrics and in, in numerology, when you study the mystery in the number, um, in biblical numbers, the number four speaks about governance over the earth. It talks about the ends of the earth, the north, the south, the east, the west. Anything that is four or, or, or multiple of four, uh, like four times 12, 48 cities that was given to the Levites uh, to live amongst the 12 tribes, four cities in each tribe, speaks about how they will create global influence by being amongst the people. So when we talk about Arba, we're talking about a man with a perfect stature, a man who has tremendous strength, but who also exercises rule over the earth. Okay, get these names in. We'll deal with it just now. Let me read this again to you so that you understand what I'm saying here. Um, Unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, 1513, Joshua, he gave a part amongst the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord, to Joshua, even the city of Arba. Arba, the father of Anak. So Arba means four square, a perfect man. And remember the city of God that descends from, from uh, that is presented to us as a descending reality in the book of Revelation 21 and 22. That city uh, where all sides are equal. It's a square. There's, there's no side that is unequal, which means that it's perfect, it's complete. So the city, uh, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak. So a perfect man with perfect strength who knows how to rule perfectly over a sphere, that man produces a son with a long neck, um, a son who has influence, who has stature, who is confident, who is resolute, 
who operates, when you see a man with a straight neck, you're talking about a man with great confidence, he has no sense of weakness in him. Okay, so when we talk about Caleb coming to take these guys, you must know what you're coming against. All right? Um, so, uh, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Sheshihai, Ahiman, and Talmi, the children of Talmahi, the children of Anak. So to take the city, which was fathered by Arba, who produced a giant called Anak, you have to take the giant by taking his three sons. Because the glory of a father is found in his sons. The strength of a father is known by his sons. The father rules through sons occupying the gates of a city. These are eternal principles. It's the seed of Abraham that makes Abraham a multitude in the earth. If Abraham is going to possess the earth, it's going to be through, through his sons. In fact, in a son, a father is immortalized. That's the principle of fathering. In a child, a parent is immortalized. So it is in that context we have to look at these sons, these sons. Okay, but before we go to looking at the names of these three sons, let's read one, one or two more scriptures. Because you have to see how and where you bury your dead. Look at Genesis 23, verses 1 to 3, and we'll read Genesis 35, 27. Because this is, if you can get to this place of perfecting relationships by possessing giants that will come to challenge your ability to possess relationships. You know, let me give you another example to help you understand this. If you went to Ezekiel's temple, the design that God gives Ezekiel in the book of Ezekiel, you'll find that the temple, and Ezekiel sees a dream of how the temple is, is occupied by unclean spirits, by false eldership, by new age thinking, and all sorts of things that come into the temple. And then Ezekiel comes to a place where he sees an altar of jealousy. And that altar of jealousy is just in front of the door that leads, beyond, leads you beyond the holies of holies. And that altar of jealousy basically says that if you want to go to the ultimate place in God, you must deal with the altar of jealousy. Now, some people interpret that to say God is a jealous God, but that's not what it's saying there. What it's saying there is that often to get to your ultimate level in God, you have to deal with the spirits that come to contend and contest against you. Often they come in the form of contestation, they come in the form of certain oppositions, they come in the form of being jealous of you, and so forth. I have found, that's why I'm so careful at times of exposing people to the, to the pulpit, especially in my global conferences, because I know we're dealing with global principalities. I found that when I put certain people to occupy certain positions, immediately after the conference, which is a great success, they are often attacked because they're not mature enough to handle the glory that came with that conference. Or they deal very badly with situations that arise in the administration of that conference simply because they did not know how to deal with the spirits that come against them. And, and I find that lots of people backslide after a glorious conference. In fact, they may not backslide as give up the faith, but they go into coldness or complacency. What happens is, and I found that with me, I, have to, I had to deal with, for many years with the spirit of depression that would step immediately after I come out of a glorious gathering. Sometimes, I mean, I would be surprised at the anointings that will work through me and how the grace of God will work. And I mean, heaven will literally come into the earth. There will be like a cloud. There will be governmental things that will happen. There will be jurisdiction that you will find. And then immediately after that, that, that conference is over, that gathering is over, the spirit of heaviness would come upon me and sometimes depression. Basically what happens when you step out of, that, out of that tangible and very imminent presence of the Lord, you immediately start to realize you're back in the valley of reality. And if you don't know how to then live, not by emotions, but by belief, you can fall into depression. And a lot of people then suffer with mood swings. That's why you can't compare a Sunday morning gathering to a corporate gathering that takes place maybe in a school or in, in the Santon Convention Center or wherever, because those are two different anointings. Because one is a local church gathering and another is a congregation of congregations. 
global congregations, two different platforms. And how people administrate that is very, very important for spiritual engagement. So, so when I talk about movement in God, you must understand that this enemy called relationships, which will rear its ugly head in various ways, if you don't know how to deal with that, but you also, also need to know how to deal with the issue of covenant with, uh, when it comes to the area of relationships. Because if I'm covenanted to Marolan, I'm not covenanted, covenanted to her just in this life. I'm con covenanted to her in this life and uh, in the life that we share together, even though her participation may be in the cloud. Okay, so look at what happens in Genesis 23, verses 1 to 3. And Sarah was 100 and 7 and 20 years old, 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in where? Kiryat Arba, which later on, the same as is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Okay, in Kiryat Arba, where relationships are perfected. The four square relationships, the perfect relations, where strength is, I mean, you know, I read the scripture to you in the first night here, a threefold cord is not easily broken. It's not easily broken, not quickly broken, okay? And he came there to this place called Hebron to weep for him. And Abraham stood up before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, and that's where he bought the cave called Machpelah. Machpelah, look at 35, 27. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is in Hebron, where, he, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. So Abraham and Isaac stayed in a place called Hebron. Okay? Sarah was buried. She not only died in a place called Hebron, but in a cave in Hebron called Machpelah, the cave of two. Machmela means a cave of two people, okay, where two live together. She was buried here. So this place is so important that the sepulchres of the patriarchs is not in Jerusalem. They are buried in this place called Hebron, even though they ruled in Jerusalem. Some of the greatest covenants are forged in Hebron. This is where blood is, is joined to blood. This is where spirit is joined to spirit. This is where one person's soul is joined to another person's soul. This is where community is built so that we become a force in the earth. This is an amazing place to dwell at. And God is calling us here to this place called Hebron. So now let's look at the sons of Hebron, uh, of Arba, the sons of Arba. Remember what Arba means, four square, perfect, stature, croucher of strength, uh, his name is also, the word Arba also means Baal, which means master. One who masters an environment called, called Hebron. Now the first son's name is Sheshai He. Everyone say it, it's a hard name, Sheshai He. That's how it's pronounced in the Hebrew. Literally, listen, listen to what this word means. Because names here are very important. The mystery of God is not just in the letter, in the number, but it's also in the name. It's in the dates. It's in the times. And the mystery of God is found in this name, Sheshahi, because he had three sons. Remember threefold cord? Three sons. Cannot be easily broken. Two is better than one. Three is better than two. Three sons. This name literally means my fine linen. My garments are made of the best linen. Now that's very prophetic. This word means white, something that is whitish, clothed in white. It means free, noble, something white, something to be. So what is the first son's name? The first son's name is I am clothed in fine linen. So let me talk about the prophetic side of this. We don't have time to go into all the scriptures. Linen is one of the most beautiful and consistent symbols of, of working by grace and not by works. In other words, it's a symbol of not working by the sweat of your brow. Okay, so when you talk about linen, you're talking about something that, that um, 
I'm trying to find the right way of describing this, that God designed, God designed to emulate an environment that is free of human efforts and human perspiration. So in the, in the, in the design of the whole, the whole disposition of the king, of the high priest of, uh, of Israel, Aaron, the house of Aaron, God designed this man to represent God. The most immaculate, the most brilliant, the most exact depiction of God was found in the high priest. For most of the year, he was dressed from head to toe to represent divinity and humanity. He was the God-man. He was the man of God. He, if you saw his clothing, certain parts of his clothing spoke about heaven. And certain parts of his clothing spoke about earth. His head carried a kind of a mitre, which was a crown. His feet were clothed in some of the best, I mean, woven into some of the best shoes. Okay, and uh, his entire being, including all the jewelry, it will represent man, and some parts of him will represent God. So when you saw the high priest walking amongst the 12 tribes, you saw God in the midst of his people. And you saw how God could identify with people because of the humanity in this priest. But once a year, this noble kingly high priest, this man that em it tried to ensample, emulate the spirit of Melchizedek, this man would have to take out all his clothes from head to toe and to quarantine himself until, until he's absolutely sure nothing unclean has come into his environment. Then he will take the purest, most noble, the whitest linen garment that had no spot, no wrinkle, and he would put it down, put it on him. The only thing he had was this linen robe. No jewelry, nothing. And, and a little to his, to his ankle, a rope would be tied with bells on it. And with fear and trepidation, he would walk beyond the curtain into the holies of all. And when he would stand there, that linen garment that he wore would symbolically mean, I am not coming to you in the regal and noble position that I enjoy amongst the people, but I come to you not by works, not by status, not by who I am. I come to you as a mere human being that cannot boast of anything. I stand in your presence by grace and not by works. So the linen ephod said, I am nothing. I may be something in the eye of man. I may be something in the presence of people, but when I come before you, I am absolutely nothing. And this garment tells you that. So the first son literally means, I am nothing. So if you want to take this mountain, you want to take this place of giants, if you want to take the city of Arba, which is called Hebron, of perfect relationships, the first thing you have to do is you have to die to yourself. You have to not let your status, your degrees, your elevated position, your rankings, your financial standings, which is your assets, the symbols of success. I mean, we've all got great symbols of success in some way or the other. But when you come to take Hebron, the first thing you have to know is I am nothing. I can't boast of anything. The most beautiful picture of that is when you come into his presence. Remember the 24 elders? I think those 24 represent the 12 gates and the 12 walls. And it represents apostles and elders. Okay? The 12 plus 12. The 12 apostles, the 12 elders in the city of God. 
And these guys were the highest ranking officials within God's city. These were the people that determined immunity and access to God's people in the city of God design. But when they came before Jesus, the lamb, on the cross, and remember how Jesus approached the throne, not as a lion, but as a lamb, which means you have to live to die, live to lay down your life. In this house, if we are going to be used of God mightily, you must become nothing. You must. You know, it's so easy to get caught up with rankings. Because we all, I mean, I have the privilege in some parts of the world that I travel to where the highest officials in those countries would want to have a meeting with me. We just came back from the Dominican Republic. I mean, you get to the airport, and just as you get out of the plane, you get people to receive you, to whisk you past security, all of that stuff, into the presidential lounge so that your bags can be picked. I mean, you get all those great privileges. You get an audience with, you know, in the palace of the president with his key people about seeking the counsel of God. You get all of that, but when you come and stand before God, and before his people, if you want to get to Jerusalem, you don't talk about those things. You talk about the fact that if it was not for God's grace, I would not stand before kings. And even if I go to them, I must go chained like, like Paul, a prisoner of Christ, so that I can give Agrippa a good report of my king. You understand? That's the first thing you have to understand. You are clothed in linen ephod. That is a key position. And I can't, I can't tell you how to deal with this. You have to deal with it yourselves. We all have to deal with it. The area of pride, ego, self-centeredness. We love attention is something everyone likes. That's why we all have a mirror. Okay, we all like it. We all deal with ego. We all deal with the vices of our humanity. I don't know of a single soul in the world that doesn't in some way or the other want to get some kind of recognition. But it is in that context, the first son means I am nothing. And, and that's, the, you know, if you go to the story of Abel and Cain, Cain's name, after, they've, after the parents named the first child, and I think they were twins. They were twins. When the first child came out, they said, you will be called Cain. That's what I think. Cain, which means we place all our expectations on you. The name Cain means I have gotten. I make things happen. I am the one that will change the world. I will fix the problem my mother and father messed up. I will be the seed that will bruise the head of the serpent. That's what they did when they said you are Cain. It means you will make things happen. And because he got so caught up with his giftings that when he started to get his first produce and he wanted to build an altar to give an offering to God, he put the price on what he will give God. And he gave him a minka, which means a donation. A minka means a donation. He didn't give God the first fruits of everything he had. He gave a huge check to God, a huge offering. But God was not impressed by the offering because everything comes from God. He was not interested in the offering. He was looking at the heart. And the heart was saying, I make things happen. I will determine. I will finance God's projects. It's like today people say, I'll play the, you know, the jackpot. Because when I win it, I'm going to make the church get its land, its property. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's bad thinking. That's bad. When I get rich, I, the emphasis is on I. It's egotistical. It borders on narcissism. Okay, so I, I, that I must be crossed out. Yes. When you put the T, when you put the cross, the pole across it, then it becomes a cross. And you must die on that cross. Okay, so, so able means, able means I am nothing. I have nothing. Because the parents, when they named him, they basically said all our expectations is in the first boy. So what do we call him? So we call him vanity. We call him emptiness. We call him null and void. We call him purposeless. Because we, we trust this first guy will do everything for us. And so his name means I am nothing. And I am nothing gave the biggest offering. Because he gave the first of everything he had. Everything. So key. When we talk about uh, the, this first son, Sheshai, we are basically saying, 
I am nothing. I will keep my linen garments pure and white. And one of the symbols of the linen garment in, uh, when the priest came before God was that it repelled perspiration. It did not absorb past perspiration. So the idea with the linen garment was, that's why people love wearing it on a hot day. Um, the idea was that um, it will not represent perspiration. And anything that produces perspiration is, doesn't impress God. It is the breath of man on his works. Perspiration is your human breath on God's work, on your works, on the hand of, on your handiworks. But, but, but inspiration is the breath of God on your works. And perspiration produces anxieties and tiredness. But, uh, I mean, uh, perspiration. Inspiration produces rest and, and the gift of sleep. You can go to bed and sleep even though you know the next day you have to face a mountain. Are you understanding me? So say to your neighbor, I am nothing. And you are nothing. He must become everything. Amen? He must become everything. You know, such people don't look for positions. They don't look for titles. They don't look for recognition. They don't put on that religious look. They don't create false impressions. They're not offended if somebody doesn't thank them. Even if they ignored in the church, they will still come because when you are nothing, what do you look for? And when you have no reputation, what do you defend? Nothing. But if you have a reputation, then you've got your dignity to protect. And your dignity will become your biggest enemy. The second son... His name is Ahiman. Ahiman. And this means my brother is gifted or brother of giftings or who is my brother. First question God asked Adam was where are you? The first question that God asked Cain was, where is your brother? Cain killed his brother because his brother received God's approval. The favor of God was upon his brother. The fire fell on the offering of Abel and not on Cain. And murder gripped his heart. You know what's the biggest challenge? And this portion of scripture highlights it for us, this name, Ahiman. Ahiman says that if, when you come to a place of knowing that you are nothing, and you always prefer your brother above you. So you don't view your giftings as more important than the one next to you. But you look at the other and you say, my brother is gifted. My brother gets preference over me. My thoughts are always about where my brother is. And I would not say, am I my brother's keeper? Because Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Why are you asking me where he is? He's his own man. So what is the second son? These are giants where you learn how to defer preference. Where you look at somebody else and you honor them more than yourself. You know what sibling rivalry does in the house today? Uh, Okay, Joseph was carrying the coat of many colors. He probably got it from Reuben, who forfeited the right to be the firstborn. So his father gave Joseph the coat of many colors. Plus, the additional bonus was that Joseph was more loved than his, uh, by his father than the rest of the brothers. And then Joseph was so silly. Every time he had a dream, he told them about the dream. And it was quite explicit, the dreams. You didn't need to be discerning to know the sun, moon, and stars are going to bow to you. All the, the, the sheaves in the field is going to bow to you. And you're telling your brothers, hey, guys, these guys already hate you. Because the father is loving you more. You tell them one day, all of you are going to bow at my feet. <laughs> but because these brothers never understood destiny, prophetic plan, the sovereign purposes of God, divine election, how God will use one man to bring others into their destiny. That's how God does it. It's the set man principle. They didn't understand all of this. They immediately started to hate him. They were vengeful. And one day the ideal opportunity came for them 
to consider murdering him. Thank God for Judah who stopped that. And they sold him into slavery after throwing him into the pit. And they had to live with a lie for many years. But you know what was the problem? Jealousy. They, didn't, they could not appreciate what God was doing in that young boy. Uh, and sometimes we, like, like the brothers of David, the three brothers that were at war, much older than him, they said, what is wrong with you? You're a naughty guy. You come to war to bring cheese and bread to us, but your behavior is unbecoming of a young man. You should keep quiet. This is not talk for, for, little, for young people, for inexperienced soldiers. But bec that's because they never saw who was in him. They never saw the grace in him. They never saw that the younger brother could be more blessed than the older brothers. They couldn't understand that the least amongst them, the eighth brother, would become the first in the whole of Israel. So the key here is if you want to create a Hebronic community, it is no matter how gifted and how graced you are, you always see yourself as less than everyone around you. It's key. You can't do this in a pietous way. You can't do this with false humility. You, you have to bring yourself to a place where you know how to bow your heart to this. And one of the best ways to, to start to bring yourself to see others as more blessed, more gifted, even if you can't see it, if you can't see it, is you must learn to develop the culture of servitude. One of the best ways to become master is to become servant. If you want to be first, you must be last. If you want to be the greatest, you must become the servant, the least amongst others. Jesus said that. God would not say this if he does not do it. Do it. And today, it's, you know, in the church, it's a, it's a culture of entitlement. People owe the pastor. They must carry his bag. They must catch his coat. Some of them will even go to serve in the house. And I'm not, I'm not against the principle of honor. Because I can't any, in any way denigrate the significance of honor. Because honor brings great rewards to a church when you honor those who are amongst you and lead you. Like how you honor your parents. The honor is a phenomenal principle in scripture. But, but um, when people sit on big thrones and expect everyone to, be, to serve them, that is a fearful thought. Fearful thought. When you take advantage of the privileges you have. It's very fearful. It can be manipulative. And I want to say to all of us here today that if we are going to move to crafting a Hebronic environment, uh, uh, crafting systems that will inculcate the spirit of Hebron, which is people will feel loved, feel connected, feel joined, feel, you know, feel one with each other, then you must always prefer others as more important than, than you. There are many scriptures for it. I don't have time to go into it, but that's important. I train myself. I train myself. I go to places where I get the best chair because I'm the first amongst the speakers. I would get the best sessions. You know, I will get the TV interviews. But when I stand to talk to that group of people, I always look across the congregation and I remind myself at least five to ten times Every single soul in this building, I am here to serve them. They are not there to serve me. Yes, I get blessed when I leave because I go there with an attitude of serving. They could put a hundred thousand rand in my hand or a large volume of money or they would bless me with an honorarium or, I mean, do something to say they appreciate. That's their prerogative. I didn't put a price tag. In some place, I may not get anything. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. You're not going for money. You're not going for things. You're not going for prestige. You're not going to lay claim to the privileges. I mean, the other day I was at a place and three doctors came to me. I mean, great physicians. I mean, specialists and different. And they said, we want to serve you whenever you come into our country. We want to give you the best treatment. And I said, I'm taking such good care of in South Africa. But I mean, you get all these privileges, but you can't let that get into your head. You just simply can't. You have to go there and you know that you're there to wash their feet. You are there to strengthen their hands. You are there to encourage their hearts. You are the waiter serving at the king's table. 
They are the dignitaries, the special guests called by God to sit at the table to get the best food. And we serve them. So your brother is more important than you. Say to your neighbor, you are more important than me. And I am going to outdo you in trying to serve you. And you know what that is? You know what that is? If everyone sees the other as more important, as more gifted, as more blessed, and everyone sees the other as having something that you need, so you'll serve them. You'll look for the gift in them, the grace in them. You would have discerned the body. You would have ministered to the weakest parts of the body. And if we do it, everybody esteeming the other higher themselves, we all will get esteem as we are giving esteem. Are you understanding? So this is the second giant to take. And let me tell you, these are giants. <laughs> you know, if I told you how to get seven steps to get to your throne, you would like that. That's not a giant. That's a dwarf. <laughs> you know, five steps on how you can rule over your whole congregation. That's easy. We just have to you know, develop the art and the skills of manipulation and control, which is witchcraft. We'll have people. But we don't want that. We're going to talk about how to die, how to humble yourself, how to, how to disappear so that he can appear in us. That's what we're talking about. So the third brother is very interesting. His name is Talmai-he. Tell my he. And I like this one. It literally means to be bold or spirited in my sufferings. Nice, eh? Three brothers, three giants. These are huge figures abounding in my furrows, in my piercings, in my ridges. What does that mean? I'm nothing. My brother's something. And while I'm honoring my brother, I will be resilient in whatever I'm going through. If I'm going to suffer, or if I'm going to be like a sheep being led to my slaughter every day, I'll go to it. No matter what I go through, I'll be content. No matter what my pains are, I'll be faithful and true. Nothing will separate me from the love of God. Amen. Not tribulation, not pain, not rejection, and so forth. We, we've not produced this in the church. What we produce is people that are so sensitive that the moment they get offended, they're out of here. Or oh, if God has not met their needs the way it should have been met, then they want to point a thousand fingers as to why God has failed them or the church has failed them. Because the church is, celeb is promoting something, but it's not working in their lives. But this portion of scripture says, uh, it, it, uh, tell my he say, uh, re uh, represents learning how to be content. It's about content. In, in much and in less. When you're in a high spot or a low point. Uh, in riches or in poverty in sickness or in health. No matter what I go through, I'll be faithful. But listen, the key is not just saying I'll suffer. I'll hold on and be faithful. Because I know that morning is for a certain period. But the day, the morning will break so that my sorrows will stop. You can't have a perpetual night. Not in God. Not in God. The day will break if you stay faithful. And you know, I was telling you the story about how we, for the first three years, at least four, when I think about it, the whole 17 years in Peter Marisburg was a life of tremendous trial, tremendous trust, being broken in our spirits. You know, breaking your spirit, breaking your heart, I don't mean heartbreak, like somebody betrayed you. The, the sacrifices of God are, uh, are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Read the scriptures. OK? 
okay, the sacrifices of God. You know, with Abraham, at least 25 years after the prophecy that I'm going to give you children like the stars of the sky and the grain of sand on the, on the shores. And for 25 years in that period, he made some mistakes like he produced the Ishmael and they're still living with it now because of his weaknesses. But he had to learn how to get broken before God would give him his Isaac that will produce laughter in their lives. 25 years. It's a long time. And I'm beginning to realize that people want a quick fix gospel. They want things on the fast line of production. It's like an instant world. The things of God are free, but they're not cheap. You pay a price. But the ultimate in whatever you go through, and I say this to people over and over again, God may give you reprieve, but he will always bring the test back to you because in him you have to pass the test or you can't move on. He may give you relief. He may give you an interval. He may just give you a handout to free you for that moment from that, that problem. But if you don't learn quickly, you will come back. You'll come back. So I've learned one thing. I'm not going to want to come back there. I want to pass the test. I want to move on. I want to learn how to be content when I have. And I'm not going to let my face show what my pressures are. And believe me, you don't even know half of what I have to go through on a weekly basis. But I'm not going to let our faces declare or show what I know is preparing me for a greater position in him. Because without suffering, there's no crown of glory. And the, pre- the sufferings of this present life cannot be compared with the glory that he has for you. I think in the AFM church, they used to have a sign growing up, no crown, no, no, uh, no, how did it go? No, no crown without the cross. No crown without the cross. So I'm saying to you, it's easy to say I'm nothing. It's easy to say my brother something. But while you're doing that, you have to stay in a position where you are bound in your furrows, in your sufferings, in your pains. And that's where you have to be good-spirited, you have to be patient, you have to be long-suffering, you have to prevail, you have to be resolute, you have to keep going, and you must not give up. Even if the grave overtakes you, it doesn't matter. You would have stored up for you a greater crown of glory. But let me tell you, in this season, you'll see it happening in your lifetime. Okay? Now, there's a man that I want to place on record. His name is Nabal. And his name literally means a fool. And he was from the family of Caleb. Now, Caleb took these guys. Caleb conquered this place. Caleb possessed it. How did he possess it? By occupying, by possessing these three sons. I am nothing, my brother something, and I will be faithful in my furrows. I'll be bold and spirited in my sufferings. That's how he took it. So how do we create a Hebronic culture? Three things. You you empty yourself of who you are. You always highlight the persons around you. And whatever you're going through, be faithful. Be resilient. Now, don't be like Nabal, because the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail, 1 Samuel 25, 3. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. The name Nabal, if you went and studied it, means a fool. And I tell you what the word fool means, because Jesus on the road to Emmaus Post-resurrection, he appears with these two guys who are going seven miles from Jerusalem, and he has a conversation with them, and he discovers that they are lamenting the crucifixion. They're telling him about the crucifixion, and then when he eventually, he, he, I think he gets frustrated with them, and he says to them, oh, you fools, and slow of heart. Um, the word slow of heart means missing and the understanding of the times in which you're living. That's what the word means. But the word fools means you that do not have a spiritual IQ or a brain to understand spiritual things. A fool is somebody, you can have the highest IQ in the natural. You could be an all A, a distinction student out there. You could conquer every subject in your field. You could be a professor over your discipline. 
But if, when it comes to spiritual things, if you don't have a mind for it, you would be classified as a fool. As a fool. This is an unintelligent position that, that does not understand spiritual ways of doing things. And this man did not understand. He could not discern. He never appreciated grace that was in his environment. He didn't understand that his immunity and his prosperity came because of a band of, of, of soldiers headed by a man called David. And he rejected the hospitality of David. And as a result, he had a heart attack that night. And he died. He literally was removed because he couldn't understand the times. And this was a son of Caleb. He came from the same family that conquered and possessed and took mountains but did not understand. I'm asking you today when you leave this place that you will, your IQ will be high when it comes to spiritual things. And you will understand that if you want Hebron, you must deal with this foolish mindset that comes with, that comes with um, people like Nabal that lives in such rich heritages as the family of Caleb. For the sake of time, I want to run through a few more things. So you think we can take these three sons, possess this place called, and Caleb did it. He set the template. He set the example. Now we must live in it. But long before Caleb came into the world, Hebron was a very, very powerful place that the patriarchs used. And our, the father of our faith, Abraham, built an altar at Hebron. Let me show you the scriptures here. Um, uh, he, Genesis 13. I want to read Genesis chapter 13, verse 1 to 18. We're going to stop at 6 o'clock, okay? So this is going to be a long session. And we'll close it. Is that okay? Okay, pinch your neighbor and say, how's it going with the siesta time? Okay, I know some of you are having heavenly dreams on me. I can feel it right here. <laughs> My side is not so good to see, but I can see. <laughs> All right, Abraham built an altar at Hebron. Genesis 13, let me read. And, Abra and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot was with him. Say to your neighbor, Lot was with him. <laughs> and I must tell you, that was a lot. That you were taking with him. Okay? And you all got a lot. With you. With you. All right? With him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in? Cattle, in silver, in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel. Unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai. Bethel means the house of God. And Ai means a place of rubbish. Or a heap of stones. So you must talk now about where you want to be. A heap of stones assembled in a certain way that produces a house of God. Or a heap of stones that's classified as rubbish. Okay? AI. And to the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of Jehovah. And Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Look at what Abram had, okay? Look at what Abram had. Cattle, silver, gold. What did Lot have? Flocks, herds, tents. Can you see it? And let me tell you in the season, people, people you know God told me this, and, and some of my people from Peter Marisburg are here, all those young people, Benson and Callan and, Jared. Anyone else from Ellisburg? I don't want to leave you out. Put your hand up. Okay, no one else. And they know. I told them, and Marisburg was a place where we could not, I mean, literally, money. You couldn't do things because you had money. You had to do things because you had a word from God. Literally. We bought properties and all sorts of things, not with money. Just getting a word from God. Supernaturally. And I told them that God is going to allow us to see millions pass through our hands. And I think most of the people that were part of that group, you know that group that I told you about? <laughs> they must have mocked me and laughed. And some of them told me in my face, you're a dreamer. But I believed that without 
any schemes, any fundraising schemes, any of these pyramid schemes, these get-rich-quick schemes, I believe that if you honor God, he will bless you with houses, with silver, with gold, and all that. And I'm absolutely convinced that a paradigm will be broken in this season, Amen. that the children of God should remain poor. But I'm also convinced that you will see servants of God. Amen. I got up this morning with a vivid feeling in my spirit that large wealth will come to men of God without fleecing the sheep Amen. and without fiddling with that yeah. basket. Yeah. Men of God are going to get very rich in this season. And my father Abraham tells me that you're not going to get herds. You're going to get silver and gold also. Remember, he just left with tents from Syria. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife. Everyone say strife. strife. You know what strife is? A relational situation between two people, two parties. And the strife wasn't between Abraham and Lot. It was between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. So two groups of people were fighting for land. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, listen to our father. Let there be no strife, I pray thee. Between me and you and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Can you adopt that position of our father? Amen. You know, I have a position like this, and I've been tested recently with my projects, whatever I'm doing. And my position is very simple. If there's a benefit of a doubt, my contractor gets the benefit, not me. If there's an argument, I defer it to him. If he says, this is what's owed to him, and I know it's not true, I give him what is due to him. That's my principle. Because I don't want strife on my land. Let there be no strife. I'm not going to win a few rand, but let a devil come and camp in my property. I learned from a preacher many years ago. What was his name? I can't remember him. His name now. The one that spoke about butter my bread and sugar my tea. Okay. <laughs> Age has caught up with us, but let me get to the point. <laughs> he said this, and I'll never forget it. He said, internal strife opens the door to an external adversary. As if there is strife in your environment, a devil has a legal right to camp in the place where the strife is taking place. If there's strife with your staff, a demon, and you, a demon has a right to camp there. And he has a legal right. You can plead the blood. You can say, I bind you. I cast you out. You can pray the whole night. You can do all the things that religious people do. I guarantee you that that devil will be sleeping while you're praying. He would not be moved. <laughs> not be moved. Strife is a big enemy. It will rob you. It will eat. It will take away love. It will cause you to fight and so forth. Do not let strife grab you. That's a principle. It's a principle. I mean, two weeks ago, I had to release somebody from my property because he changed the price three times on us. And I said, bless him, give him a gift, release a few thousand. I'd rather lose other things. But I'd rather let him go knowing that I've not defrauded him. And if he feels that he's entitled to certain things, add a little bit more to his wages. Give it to him. Why? Because I will not let strife come into my environment. Are you hearing me? This is very important. There can be no strife. I would say it like this. Lose the argument so that you can preserve the peace. Do not get into contentions and debates and argue about whose theology is right. Just say, okay, you're entitled to your view. I bless you. Let's just keep the peace. If somebody comes sincerely and says, educate me, it's a different story. So this is what our father did. And Abraham said unto the Lord, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers 
is not the whole land before you. Separate yourself, I pray thee, for me, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If, you will, if thou take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. Wow. This is extremely generous. And Lot lifted up his eyes, beheld all the plain of Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere before Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of Jehovah, like the land of Egypt as thou goest unto Zohar. So Lot chose him all the plain of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners against Jehovah exceedingly. And Jehovah said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to your seed forever. See, when you give the benefit of the doubt, God gives you the benefit. Okay? And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then may they, thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for unto thee will I give it. And now look at what happens. And Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built there an altar unto Jehovah. When could he move his tent? Only when he dealt with his lot and the strife that came with his lot. If he never dealt with lot and with the strife, he could not come to, the, to a place called Mamre, which is in Hebron. And you know what happened in Mamre? Angels came and visited him there. Under the tree, they came and visited him to tell him what they have planned to do. Angelic visitations takes place at, a, at, the, at, the, at the arena called Hebron where you've perfected your relationships. And you know how I know that Abraham never carried strife against Lot? Because he could be bitter and say, this selfish guy, he doesn't realize that when my brother died at such an early age, my father took him in. And when my father died, I took him in. I treated him like a son. I blessed him. I gave him everything. I treated him so well. Uh, and now this is what he does to me. He doesn't appreciate it. He doesn't do all that. And you know how I know that there was no strife in Abraham? When the angels came many years later and said to Abraham, we're going to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why we came to visit you. And we're going to destroy these two cities because of the sin in it. Abraham's heart was moved for Lot. He said, you can't do that. If there's 50 people there, will you save the city? And eventually he couldn't even get 10. So he just said, let Lot go. And his family. That tells me that when he's... When his own nephew treated him so badly, his heart never changed. He still loved him. That's Hebron. Then you can move your tent to Hebron. You don't get to Hebron to deal with issues. You have to first deal with your issues before you get to Hebron. The Bible tells us that Abraham purchased a cave in the field of Machpelah meaning the double cave, for a burial of his wife, Sarah, Sarah, and it was in Hebron. So great was the value of this place, Hebron, that, that Abraham chose to build, to, build to, to bury his wife in the same place that he established this culture of relationships. Abraham understood something, that Hebron is that place you arrive at after you deal with issues like soul ties, 
like strife, like biological connections that so often hinder your movement forward and so forth. Then only you can get to a place called Mamre. You know what Mamre means? Mamre means improved sight, vision, clarity from bitterness. So he moved his tent after he got the, all those issues dealt with. Now he moved to Mamre where his sight improved, his vision increased, his spirit got purer. Now in that place, angels came to minister to him. And he decided that if this is the purest place in my journey in God, and this is the place I bury my wife, and when I die, I get buried there also. So whether we are in life or in death, we'll be joined together. You know, if you went to, to Numbers chapter 13, verse 22, something very interesting happens. Can you put Numbers 13, 22 on the board? Let me turn it. Can you see the benefits of coming here? To Hebron? Do you think we can do this? Come on, some of you are sleeping on me now. You're not saying amen. Do you think we can do this? You really think so? Do you know that when the nation of Israel were going to come into the inheritance of what God was going to give them, uh, the spies came back. Let's read from verse 17. Then Moses sent them, sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and he said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains, verse 17. Okay, verse 18. And see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron. Ahiman, Sheshihahi, Sheshahi, and Talmahi, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and there cut down a branch. This is in Hebron, eh? A branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between uh, two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and the figs. The place was called the Valley of Eshkol because the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. So here's a very important point, that even when the spies went to spy out the land, they went to Hebron and the Valley of Eshkol in Hebron to apprise what is the quality of the crop out there. In other words, something, something happens in this place of perfect relationships. In fact, in that environment, some of the most beautiful fruit, some of the most productive um, things you want in life will be experienced. I guarantee you that if you create the strife-free, pure environment, and all of you in marriages here, please take my advice, and you young people that are planning to get married, is you deal with these issues. I'm not saying that you won't have your, your differences as you're growing into the relationship. You'll have that. But try and preserve or protect any attempt of strife creeping up into your marriage. And then the policy is that you have a disagreement, deal with it. But before the sun sets, sort your problems out. Okay? Go to bed without your problems so that you don't have to carry it over the next day. Because it accumulates. It accumulates and eventually your marriage becomes bankrupt. But here's the point. When you build this environment of being stress-free, of dealing with your heart, perfecting relationships, especially in your businesses and so forth, I guarantee you, you'll see some of the most productive, some of the best fruit, some of the greatest breakthroughs taking place in that environment. I guarantee you it will happen. Okay, Hebron. You can go on and read about Hebron. Hebron was just an amazing city, amazing city. There's so many things I can talk about here, and we don't have time to go into it. But it was at Hebron also that Absalom, the son of David, 
produced one of the greatest insurrections against David's kingdom. And this is the negative side. Hebron can also become the place of false alliances. When, uh, when Absalom wanted to take the kingdom from his father and he felt his father wasn't doing a great job, he started to move a group of people in Jerusalem to follow his ideologies for how the country should be read, led. But what he did was he didn't plan, he didn't launch his, his plan to take over the kingdom from Jerusalem, which was the capital. But he went to a place called Hebron. And it was at Hebron he brought people, and some of the best men that were with David, they, they left David and joined Absalom at Hebron. And, and the place was so, so powerfully you know, uh, built up that they, they covenanted with, with, the, with, with Absalom at Hebron. And when David heard that at Hebron, Absalom became king, the people coronated him there. David literally went into fear. He didn't immediately raise up his army to, to defend his kingdom, but David immediately asked his people to take him secretly out of the city of Jerusalem to a place called Gilgal, where David went to review how the kingdom would be given to him. I mean, so powerful is this place that even if you build a false alliance there in terms of relationships, you become so impenetrable, so indestructible because of this place. I would say to all of us here today, and my time is up and I've not finished the series, but um, I would say to all of you that if we are going to be a powerful people in the earth, you must perfect relationships by embracing all the characteristic features that is resident with this place called Hebron and the kind of people that occupied it because they would in, any, in many ways tell you of how uh, Hebron, you know, becomes a place of perfect relationships. Now, in this house, I really want to see this. We've done the series in the past year, but most of you were not members of this church then. We've done it, and we may have to repeat the series later on, because this is one of the, the, the places, this is one of the places of the greatest strength in our journey in God. In fact, we, uh, let me close the story that I started at the beginning of today. When God told me that I'm going to take you to a new place, and he said it's not networking. Networks and denominationalism and the way we build our traditional molds of Christianity is not the way. He took me to Hebron. And step by step, he showed me all the principles at Hebron. In fact, some of the greatest movements of God in Scripture first started at Hebron like how Abraham moved to Mamre in Hebron, and that's where his vision and got clear and his spirit got pure, purer and so forth. Then he dealt with issues. Similarly, God will take us to Hebron. He took David to Hebron first. Sons were born to David at Hebron before he had sons born in Jerusalem. Sons were born there. Families were joined together. He became so powerful in Hebron that, that from Hebron, he could establish himself so that he could become king in Jerusalem. Let me say this to you. Your greatest breakthroughs don't take place when you get to the ultimate point of your journey. The penultimate is important. You know, the Bible says that David ruled for 40 years as king, 33 years in Jerusalem, and seven and a half years in Hebron. But if you add, this, add up the numbers... Seven and a half plus 33 gives you 40 and a half, but the Bible says 40 years. God does not recognize the half year. And you know what seven means, the number of perfection. Completeness, wholesomeness. Seven is the most beautiful number in Scripture in terms of something getting complete and, and entering into a place of rest. The number seven is also the number of rest. But think about this. God is saying seven and a half. He adds a fraction. And that fraction of a half literally means you have to go beyond perfection. Sure. You're, not gonna, you're not going to do this sitting on your rocking chair. You have to strive for, for relationships. You have to strive for perfection. You have to strive to enter, and I mean this in the spirit, because we don't do things carnally. You have to prevail until the relationships you have to, uh, are perfected. You, and, and, and in some cases, others won't treat you the way you treat them. You must believe this. You know, I'm at peace with everybody, but they're not at peace with me. 
They will continue throwing their spears and their, their arrows and their, you know, throwing whatever they want to throw, their stones or whatever. I'm not interested in that because I know that my heart is at peace with them. I have prevailed. Today, you tell, I mean, some people, you just drop one little statement. They're offended they leave your church. That's, those are people still in diapers, but you still have to live with them. But how they behave is not the way you behave because we are into this culture that unless I go into my beyond seven year position of Hebron and God showed me all of these things. And so, so we have this family of churches now and it's growing all the time. People are joining us all the time and it's built on one fundamental principle. Hebronic relationships. We are not building a network, we're building families. Families based on love, that's stri strife-free, stress-free. Families that can deal with issues. The guys know I can call a spade a spade. There are times I take the dagger out and remove the foreskin. I mean, we are, you have to do all this stuff. I mean, we can deal with all those issues. This is not pampering people. And um, but it's, a, it's an environment of love, it's an environment of peace, it's an environment of joy. Uh, you can do great things uh, because you're not building, you're not building some, some Nimrod system, some pyramid system of a room. We're building family and, it's, and we're joined by love, we're joined by a covenantal relationship. Yeah, what's mine is theirs, what's theirs is mine. We are bone of each other's bone flesh of each other's flesh, how the marrow is the same, the spiritual DNA is the same, there's a connectivity in the spirit, and believe me, when you have that sense of feeling, you can take nations, you can take Goliaths, you can jump in the pit and take on a lion, you can stand in a field and defend it against a hundred Philistines, you can do all sorts of things, why? Because we are one, we are one. And that's what God is calling all of us to be. If this little congregation here, Gate Ministry, Santon, or whatever congregation you belong to, if you really want, if you know how to live in this environment of Hebron, let me tell you something. God will bless you. God will bless you. In this season, you can't sulk and get offended. You know, and sometimes God will cause offense to come your way. He'll cause you to get insulted just to test your heart. To see what you made up of. And some people are so full of themselves, so full of pride, they'll, they'll tell you that they're humble. But the way they tell you, you know they're full of pride. <laughs> you can't look them in the eye. They, they speak with pride. There's arrogance. There's no brokenness. There's no humility. You'll never get to Hebrew. Never. You may say that you're part of a Hebronic community, but you'll never be there. This is a season of you know, total surrender of complete devotion to God, of honoring people, of loving, of blessing. You do this, I'm telling you, we'll heal South Africa. Yes. There'll be no more all the pains of racial and language and class and, you know, all these monopolies and all this stuff. There'll be just pure love that will flow. Even the poor will say, I'm rich. Because we'll share what we have. We'll be a blessing to everybody. Amen. So that brings us to conclusion.